My name is Ed Salisbury, and I have with me Peter and Robert, who will be sharing personal experiences of why we are devoted to caring for the dying. And with that said, I'm going to ask to start with a five, sec five or ten sentence invitation initiation about what brings you here. Peter? My name is Reverend Peter Panagor. I'm a Congregational United Church of Christ minister. I'm a two-time near-death experiencer. I died ice climbing in 1980 up in Banff National Park of hypothermia. I died two years ago of a genetically based heart attack. The first time I crossed over completely, the second time I was welcomed home and was given the chance to stay. And the first time I asked to come back, both times for the sake of love. As a result of my first near-death experience, my heart was completely turned over and I understood that I belonged to God alone and not even to myself. I changed the course of my life. I didn't go to graduate school in architecture to join the family firm. I went to divinity school at Yale to study the history of mysticism while I put off joining the Trappist monastery uh, that was nearby where I lived, where I had been studying meditation for a number of years. When I was at the divinity school, the dean of students allowed me to become an independent study student because Yale didn't offer a degree in mysticism. She oversaw my studies and then convinced me to become a congregational minister. I figured following the, the lead of Wordsworth and Blake that I could hide inside the church and pray for a living. My life had become a practice of prayer and study and thinking. So it turned out my sweet spot in ministry was death. I became the go-to guy in our community for the death and dying. I didn't come out of the closet until uh, many years into ministry, just before I left pulpit ministry. So for all the years that I practiced uh, helping those who were dying and those who were grieving, I kept it to myself. And yet I found myself in the position in the community to be the person that everybody called upon. Um, I got into the chaplaincy as a result of having a near-death experience when I was 20. And that experience, as we've heard in many of the uh, presentations over the weekend here, uh, altered me. It was very important to me to have the sense and treasure the sense that death is a sacred passage. You know, I, I was raised, I was born Jewish, but I was placed in four Christian boarding schools before I was 12. And I was very imprinted by some of the experiences that I had with uh, communion and church. And <clears throat> my, my sense of serving as a chaplain was the, the amazement of why we have so much attention on death and so little real focus on birth. My first child, I didn't get to see her born, but when they presented her to me wait, as I was waiting in the father's waiting room, I was absolutely flabbergasted by the event of this new being that came through my wife into this place we call the, the real world. And my near-death experience just was there speaking to me 
in ways that are very difficult to uh, describe. But um, we've heard a lot of language about how the ethereal is expressed. And, and I have my own favorite ways of relating to that. But that's how I got involved in being a chaplain, to service people who were um, new parents with newborn. And one of my very first experiences was a, uh, uh, the death of a child during birth. And I had to deal with that uh, event uh, with the new parents, the would-be parents. And um, I had many, many powerful experiences over 14 years uh, at the hospital as a chaplain. Thank you, Robert. <clears throat> Namaste, y'all. I'm honored and it's a pleasure to vi visit with you. My name is Ed, Brother Ed, the seldom Reverend Dr. Salisbury to my students, and sometimes called you know, Dr. Death. I never intended to do this as a profession. My college degree was in logic and physics. Then I died in a car wreck and had this mystical experience neither the doctor nor my minister would accept as a reality. And I wandered in confusion until I found places like the Edgar Cayce Institute and Monroe Institute and then finally IANS. And my life experience brought me to this place from a near-death experience in the car wreck to losing my love of my life in a drowning when I was unable to save her in a sailboat accident, to dying again in a swimming pool and on an operating table. And I guess some of us keep being sent back until we get it right. So here I am trying to get it right. To that end, I would like to open the discussion up in more depth with my associates and partners here. Why we minister to the dying? What is it that brings us to this calling? And then we will open it up for in interaction and questions, input as well. And with that, I'd like to go back to Peter and ask, why are you doing this? I, I was doing it. Uh, for the last 14 years, I spent 18 years doing it. The last 14 years, I've been a broadcaster on two NBC stations in Maine as a morning two-minute sacred storyteller for a 90-year-old oldest religious broadcast in America. And you can find us at dailydevotions.org. But when I was a minister, I found myself being a midwife to death. As a near-death experiencer, I have no fear of death. I have seen many people die very painful deaths, and some people die not so painful deaths. But by attending their deaths either just merely as a presence, just standing in the room, or by holding their hand, or by helping them face whatever regrets that they may have, or by helping them learn to pray at the last moment, or by being present with the family as they pass, I found that I had a very calming presence to the dying and to the grieving. And they tell me that I gave good funeral. That's how it was put. You give good funeral, Peter. As a midwife to the dying, I found it to be my duty as a servant of God to help people understand that all would be well when they leave and to fear not. Many of the elderly when they die are well adjusted to the idea of their mortality, but not all of them. Many of the young are not well adjusted to their idea of mortality. And I would spend many hours with each person talking to them about why they should not fear death without revealing that I was a near-death experiencer. I kept it a secret until long after I finished, um, till 
just before I finished my work as a pulpit pastor. I kept it a secret because it was kooky, but it didn't matter whether I kept it a secret or not because the calmness of my demeanor and the face of crisis and death enabled everyone else to be calm. I'll tell one brief story. I live in a harbor town, and I would frequently row to the hospital in a rowboat. One Sunday afternoon after church, I got the phone call that a man in our community, a known ex-smuggler, I live in a, a fairly pirate place, a known ex-smuggler, kind of a rough fella, but whose daughter was my daughter's friend, was dying of hepatitis C. The family had gathered and they called me. They weren't church members. I rode across the harbor. I got to the waiting room. The entire family was there. It's the kind of community where people don't leave, and there must have been 30 members of their family in this little room. I was sitting, talking to the family when the nurse burst in and said, Peter, a nurse, a deacon in my congregation, Peter, we need your help. Okay. I walked down the hall. She said, put on a gown, put on the gloves, put on the mask. We need you to come in and hold his, his nickname was Beaver. We need you to come and hold Beaver. I walked into the room. There were two or three nurses and a doctor and Beaver was in a panic and he was bleeding out of all of his orifices. He was super frightened of dying because of what he had, how he had lived his life. A dissolute life. Good hearted, but a dissolute life. I crawled into the bed with him, moved behind him, wrapped my arms around him while being bled over, and began to whisper in his ear, it's okay. You don't have to be afraid. God loves you. Trust me. Trust the light. You can let go, Beaver, and you can know that God will catch you. There are words that most clergy say, but somehow or other, he calmed down because of the light that shines through all of us and the presence of the divine that radiates from all of us and from me. And Beaver died in my arms, a calm and peaceful death instead of a tumultuous death of turmoil. From that day forward, I became the go-to guy. The most beautiful death I saw was an 86-year-old man, well-to-do, had been a church member his entire life, whose children gathered in a house and called me and said, you've got to talk to dad. He needs to go to chemotherapy. We want him to stay. I went and I talked to Bob. I said, Bob, your kids they want you to stay, they want you in chemotherapy. And he looked at me with his, his beautiful, light-filled blue eyes and said, Peter, I've been going to church my entire life. I've been preparing for this for my entire life. I'm smiling. I'm going home. Can you help convince my family that that's the best course of action? Ministry just isn't about midwifing the dying into death. It's about helping the grieving accept the inevitable and the decisions of the dying. Powerful, very powerful. I need to stand. Um, I turned 80 a couple of months ago, and um, I brought something I want to I came through one of these in 1937. It was an opening in my mother's body. I came out into this place. 20 years later, I worked on the flight deck of an aircraft carrier. I was a plane captain. A plane captain is not a pilot. 
A plane captain's job is to assist the pilot with his gear, arm his missiles, strap him in, arm his ejection seat, and last, to pre-flight the aircraft. A very carefully orchestrated process of checking out the plane to the pilot's satisfaction that it was ready to fly. On one given day, after doing this job for six months, with very little deviation, I was sucked into the intake about this size, full body all the way in at full power, and died. The, um, the story gets very juicy here. Because I was in this plane with my arms flung forward, and I smashed my head on the axle of the turbine, and it stopped flight operations. Flight operations on a flight deck of an aircraft carrier are highly choreographed. Every move of every plane is simultaneously monitored by the, the flight deck director um, up in the tower. So they had to stop the operation. They pulled the, my plane off to the side, and a man in my squadron crawled into the intake, was in there for less than a minute because it was so hot inside that he couldn't stand it. He had to crawl back out. They talked about dismantling the plane with four or five men trying to take it apart, but they knew that that would take too much time, and so they just waited for the plane to cool off. The man crawled back in, cut my jacket that was caught in the turbine, and pulled me out, laid me on the deck. And they called the chaplain to give me last rites. I had no life signs. My dog tag said I was Jewish, but the Jewish chaplain was not available. And they called the Catholic chaplain. And I watched the Catholic chaplain kneel next to my body take out a lavender ribbon and start to utter the words of last rites. At which point, I went back into my body and opened my eyes and spoke to him. He was stunned. I had no life signs. He was giving me last rites. Now I'm speaking to him. And I said to him these words, Father, don't you know I'm Jewish? He, he could not answer. He was so stunned. And I could feel, and I use the word loosely, feel. It wasn't really a feeling. It was a, a continuous knowing of what his state of emotion was. And I said to him, in very clear terms, it's okay, Father, you'll do. And then I left my body. While I was speaking to him, I had absolutely no pain. When I was watching him, I was interested in what was going on down below me but I had absolutely no interest or attachment to the outcome. I was fine. They took me down to sick bay, which is a very modern portion of the ship. And it, uh, had, we had six doctors aboard and lots of corpsmen. They had me on a gurney. I had no life sign. But Father Fitzpatrick had told them that I had spoken to him. Based on that, 
they attempted to bring me back to uh, consciousness in the usual way, the fibrillators and what have you. But they couldn't bring me back. They called Dr. Father Fitzpatrick back. He gave me last rites a second time. I was a slow learner. They did bring me back, or I did, I wouldn't even say they brought me back. I entered my body and was conscious with life signs. I had no ability to speak, and um, I was taken to, sick, to a, a bed. At, at one point, they took me to x-ray. All my, I had many broken bones. I had a very severe uh, concussion. My right arm was practically off, and they needed to know my internal injuries and what to do. So they took me to x-ray, and two corpsmen laid me on a very hard surface. And I came into my body and I was swearing, I was angry, I was in excruciating pain, and I spoke to them. I said, why are you treating me this way? And they were stunned as well, because I was unconscious when they, they started the procedure. My point about this story is, the veil that we consider death, or the other side, is not really the word veil is interesting, but it's a state of mind. It's a frequency of our energy. It's something that we access probably a lot. When we have intuition, when we have an impulse, we are in some harmonic way connected to our essence, the very presence of that which animates our bodies. In psychology, there wasn't a whole lot of attention paid to just being here. I studied about normal behavior, the bell curve, and uh, early childhood deprivation. When I was three years old, I was taken to a foster home. Before that, I was not a feeling child. I wasn't touched when I was in my first foster or, uh, placement, which was really an orphanage. And then I was sent to another place, a Baptist children's home, and I was rarely touched there. When I went to my foster home, I had a foster mother who usually had four to five kids in a small house with her husband, George. Her name was Effie Hogan. I'm, I'm just going to say this, that Effie touched me, bathed me, and acknowledged me in ways that were profoundly impactful. At the same time, she was strict and somewhat distant because she was very skilled at being a foster mother. But she was the first person that invited me to come into my emotional body because I never really bonded with my mother and other um, relatives um, as an infant and as a toddler. Robert, can I keep you on point about why now you're ministering to the dying? The, the um, experience that I have when I go into a room where somebody is critically ill or dying, and some people I, I, I actually ministered to that had been in the hospital dying 
more than two or three times. Uh, but they, they, they hung on and they were discharged from the hospital. But to me, the passage of an individual from birth and the arc of their life is so purposeful, so rich, so intimate, so beyond objectifying. The one thing that I realized when I was out of my body is I didn't have a life review. What I had was a direct knowing. Mm -hmm. I am the love I seek. Amen. That was the sum total, because I was looking to be included. I was looking to make sure I was safe. I was looking to be um, loved, affection. And when I looked at a, a person who was about to make that transition, to me it was, it was a little bit of a double bind, because when you're in a room with family. Some of the family are in abject grief. Sometimes there's a member of the family that's angry. And other times there's people that are very, very with, withholding. It all has to do with what we would call generally as unfinished business mm -hmm. with this dying person. But I knew that this was a sacred passage. That's why I was there. I felt comfortable knowing from my own experience that there was going to be an exalted state within that transition. Thank you. If we may. Thank you, Robert. Yes. I hate to cut it short because I know we all have so many exciting messages that we want to do. Why? Do we minister to the dying? And I think you just expressed it so beautifully. It's a sacred experience. We witness and have the opportunity to be at the doorway when the spirit sheds its mortal coil and goes on to the next dimension. Regardless of whatever definition we might hold on to, that passage, that moment, has been some of the most rewarding experiences in my life. I got into this kind of dragged unwillingly and objectively in that, um, you know, I'd had a near-death experience and when I tried to tell it to my doctors, they said you were hallucinating, drug-induced. So I went to my minister and he said, don't say that, that's the work of the devil. And it wasn't for many years that I finally found this organization and others that made me realize there's a misunderstanding in the public. I went off to seek other ways and ended up uh, marrying a lady who was a sweetheart of my life. And when she drowned because I was unable to save her, I got angry at God. And it was many years later, after I had another drowning experience myself and met first my grandfather and then met her in my near-death experience and she, she it was like it was the day I married her that she was there in all her glory and she embraced me and said your grief your anger holds me back please let me go I squirmed, I could not and would not, and I, like a baby who said, but please, you don't understand. I, it should have been me, not you. And I argued, and I don't know how long I dwelled in that point, and her constant love was, it's what meant to be. Then she turned me around in loving arms when I finally accepted the truth and looked down at my body in the pool, and she says, now is that any way to leave your family? I looked at her. I looked down there and I said, damn, I hate it when you're right. <laughs> and spirit put me back in that body coughing up blood and water on the edge of the pool as my cousins came out of the house saying, what happened? 
not much later, I ended up being um, directed by a, well, I went first to ministers, and then I went to study masters in India and was sent back to say, don't serve yourself, serve others. So instead of going back to my career in computers and technology, I came home as an orderly in a nursing home. And a year or so caring for someone in a nursing home gives you an intimate experience with watching people die. And I've come to recognize how so many of our nursing homes are warehouses for the dying. And my passion is to transform how we do death and dying in our communities. I'm so glad to be connected with so many of you who bring messages and programs and organizational efforts to transform how we do death and dying. Uh, my dad died in my own arms in his hospice care. Um, and <clears throat> I'll close this part of it with just three three weeks ago. I'm from Austin, Texas, and my wife and I were so looking forward to coming here. I had to set up my local chapter meeting that's happening this moment in Austin. And I got a call from my sister-in-law. Now, she married a, a gentleman <coughs> 30 years ago. And when I married my wife 20 years ago, he became the big brother I always wish I had. Well, Linda calls me and says, Gene has been sent home from the hospice program and he's dying. All of the kids have come and they've all gone back to their homes and their jobs. Can you come? Well, I had to look at my wife. And this is a, what we need to do. And 24 hours, we were bedside in Florida tending to my big brother, Gene. He rallied out of a coma. We had two or three days of wonderful communication. I got to be an orderly and bathe and assist him again. Friday, two weeks ago, the, um, he's almost he's squirming, the death rattle. We who work with this recognize the signs. And the, uh, we couldn't understand why he, he was just not ready to go. My sister-in-law, Linda, kept giving him little drips of uh, water and medicine. And finally, the aide came and gave him a full bath, and he kind of smiled. At last, he was clean and fresh. And there it was. <coughs> At 2.12 in the afternoon last Friday, I'm sitting at the foot of the bed in the chair just trying to be practicing the presence as many of us here have learned to do. And his one daughter who said she couldn't be back until late at night walked in the door and I watched him as she said, Daddy, I'm here. And he did this, ah. I witnessed a white light come out of him and go up in a circle, kiss his daughter, kiss my sister-in-law, fly over my head and out the door. And those kind of experiences cannot be packaged. I'm sorry, but that's, that's the gift that calls me to keep coming back to do this to be servants to our family, our friends, our community, teaching us how to die with dignity and compassion. And to that end, I invite the community here to tell us your stories, answer your questions. And who would be first? Come to the microphone, please. Robert, would you like to start? So please come up. God is calling. Please come forward.
Um, my name is Pete. I'm um, a little afraid to come to the microphone. I've never shared this story, but Peter, you, I, um, you, you, I connect with you. My wife died in October. Um, and the, she wasn't on hospice. She, she was long-term ALS, uh, and her dying was a surprise, actually, because she was actually doing very well. She'd been on a ventilator for about eight years, and uh, I'd been her caregiver for that long. We developed a, an incredible bond during that time, and um, I had been all ready to two of these conferences, uh, and I was hoping for the peaceful experience. Now, I don't know what hers was. Um, she didn't die from ALS. She actually was given heparin in the hospital uh, uh, earlier, and uh, nobody knew that she was bleeding out, but that's what happened. We'd been out on a date the night before. We'd gone to the movies and, and been to dinner, um, you know, uh, in her wheelchair, and it was, a, it was a good evening. The morning that she died, her hands were cold, her feet were cold, not entirely unusual, but something felt different that morning, and for the last hour of her life, I was in panic and fear and not in peace. I can't say what, she, what her experience was, because she, uh, she tried a time or two to, to open her eyes and respond as we were speaking with her. And at the moment of her death, I, I left her bedside and I went around the corner and sat and in panic and fear. Um, and my caregiver, uh, our, our helper, she called me and she said, Pete, come please, something's not right. And of course I went and she was gone. Um, so that's the story. Uh, I don't know what you you might say about it, but um, I just wanted to share it with you. That's all. Yeah. You did everything. You did everything that you could do over a long period of time, and I'm sure that you grieved for her health and for her dying long before the day came. And I pray that you find healing in the meantime between now and your departure. I already have. Excellent. Yeah, I'm still in grief, but it's no longer sadness. I'm f um, full of appreciation for, for what I had, what we had together. Uh, that's all I feel anymore. That's the but, best. But um, that moment didn't go like I thought, like I had. You know, like the ones that you described, these peaceful passages. Well, it, I, I can't say what it was for her. I, I'm sure she was looking at me going, what's wrong with you? I'm fine, you know. But, um, you know, I, it took me, I just wasn't, you know, I wasn't calm and peaceful that morning. I wish I'd been holding her hand and, and, and touching her when, when she left. But it, it happened that other way. A lot of times, uh, the dying wait till the living leave the room. Yeah. Fairly often enough. Yeah because they either wanted a private moment or they don't want you to suffer. Yeah. Uh, so There's a lot of willpower in the dying process, staying and leaving. I appreciate you. Amen. Thank you. Thanks for speaking, Pete. You know, as a student of psychology and training, I... Um, I'm very familiar with the idea of grief, the experience of grief. And one of the things that we're kind of warned about is for people that hang on to grief. My feeling about grief is there is no limit to the love that can be transmitted to people on the other side, that the love continues. It really doesn't end. Just because the body is no longer occupied, it doesn't mean that you cannot 
access the heart of that person and even their experience. And many people have reported that when they open themselves to that, they feel that they, they are hearing and feeling the experience of being just fine on the other side by the person that's lost. So we can all maintain the love. We don't have to be fixated on it per se and suffer that they're, they're gone, but the love that they are, the love that we are, is eternal. It doesn't have an ending. You know, one of the, some of the things that um, Gene said, Gene Watson in the previous presentation, about the circular quality of this life uh, touched me because I agree that the circle is quite, the, in my view, a very appropriate symbol of the eternal quality of being. I know we're down to just the last 15 minutes, and I want to, what this question brings to mind is a teaching from my experience of working with the leukemia kids in the hospital ward. Now these usually, you know, most of them go out in a bag. And I was working with this young, maybe teenage fella, and there was, you know, room, there are usually two patients in the room and uh, we would play cribbage or other things, have conversations. Well, down the hall, there was this padded room with beanbag chairs and things, and it was a poster on the front from Charlie Brown, Good Grief, Charlie Brown. Well, they'd taken some markers, and it says, Good Grief Room. So <clears throat> here I am, sitting with my friend, having met this new patient who had just come back into the room and all of a sudden this new patient's family opens the door and his sister runs up to him hugs him and says David David I'm so glad you're still here and then dad comes up pats him on the head and says son we're gonna get you through this hang in there and David takes this big sigh and turns and looks at my friend and says, can you help him? My friend gets out of the bed with his IV pole and takes this man's hand and says, come with me. And so I'm sitting there and you hear the squeak, squeak, squeak of the pole going down the hall, going into the good grief room. I'm having conversation with the rest of the family when you finally hear, oh my God, you're right. Oh, I'm so scared. Squeak, 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 and he comes back. And my friend opens the door and he lets dad run to his son. And he hugs his son and said, son, I'm so sorry. I love you, I'm afraid. And son David sits up and says, Daddy, I'm fine. I know where I'm going and I know that it's all love. Thank you. Now that transformed my idea about grief. There's goodness in experiencing and expressing it. And with that, we'll go to the next question. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, you had mentioned that one of your missions is to help transfer or trans transform the way that we handle death and dying here in America as far as uh, a lot of rest homes are like a warehouse for the dying. <clears throat> and I'm fascinated by your, your thoughts there. Uh, my mother uh, recently passed in March. She had been in Alzheimer's unit for 15 years. Uh, she went there because before she got bad, her sister had it. She wanted her sister's family to put her sister there and they wouldn't do it. So then when mom got it, we put her right in the room she had picked out for her sister. Um, but one of the thoughts I had was that uh, some of the, the businesses, corporations that run 
uh, the Alzheimer centers, and probably the, the rest homes as well. It's a profit type of deal. But they're, back in Ohio, there's banks that are called credit unions where members kind of buy in and, and get their loans or whatever they need to do. So it's kind of like a nonprofit bank kind of a deal. Uh, so I was just curious if maybe um, there was something similar to that to where as far as the financial burden that's put on the families in the end days of their loved ones being in a nursing home or an Alzheimer's unit type of a thing mm -hmm. where it could be like a credit union where people could buy into it and maybe volunteer there to help care for folks until they pass. So I'm just looking for ideas, your ideas perhaps, and others of how we could revolutionize or make things better in regards to the warehouses of the dying. Thank you. My first response would be that there are communities who are illustrating how this can be done. There are a continuum of care organizations, usually they're faith-based. Presbyterian has a nice continuum of care program in my hometown of Austin, Texas, where you and it's a waiting list to get into this retirement home that has uh, has, has continuum from independent living to assisted living to intensive nurse care, memory care, and you know, final disposition. I'm open to and excited about learning of other ones as uh, this weekend that are transforming how we accompany the dying. And I know that as we ask these questions and invite spiritual guidance, it will come to us. I personally uh, want, should I start to lose my memory any more than I already have? Thank you. Um, there's a Seventh-day Adventist retreat center in the mountains not far from here called Sunrise Ranch. And I've been there before. And next door to them is the Seventh-day Adventist Retirement Center where people are busily planning their funeral, writing their wishes, you know, and putting together not only their own obituary, but maybe their Facebook farewell presentation. So with that question, I'll pass it to my other panel members. I think one way to start this is by having a conversation in the normalization of death and dying. Our culture has a tendency to warehouse the dying. It has a tendency, we box our dead and put them in the ground and fence them in when they're gone. Dying is not seen in our culture as a normal and natural process. I think by having conversations with our loved members, the people in our family, be, there, be they in the process of dying themselves or way before that, to have conversations about what does your death, what do you want your death to look like if you have any way of controlling it? What do you want your funeral to be like? Who do you want to speak at your funeral? To normalize the dying process is to open the door to new ways of thinking as a culture. We, as our people, idolize youth and idolize birth. And as Ed mentioned, and uh, pardon me, Robert mentioned at the beginning, we shunt death off to a dark corner far away from our living. And that's just not the natural process. I want to add this, that if you're looking, how, uh, if you're thinking about how to handle death in your own family, just being attendant to the dying, to go to the hospital room and to spend time there and to hold the hand of the dying. If you're a volunteer in a hospital, hold the hand of the dying touch their cheek, brush their forehead, brush their hair. If they have a hard time speaking, lean in and listen. Let them vent everything that they have to say. Oftentimes the dying are the most honest people that you will ever meet because they want to unburden themselves and because they have nothing left to lose. Be the ear for them. And if you have nothing to say, say nothing. Don't fill the air with verbiage. Your presence matters more. Spend time in prayer in their room, even if they're not praying with you. Pray with the nurses. The nurses are the front line on this. 
nurses have much more experience in death and dying than most people give them credit for. Pray with the nurses. Ask if they will pray with you. Hold hands around the room. Pray for them. If the dying says, I see Aunt Mary coming, don't say, honey dear, she's not here. Say nothing if you can't believe it. Say, what does she look like if you do believe it? What's she doing for you? Encourage the people to go to the light. Encourage them to let go. Let them know that all will be well here and that all their unfinished business will be well there. That they don't need to worry about their children. That they can pass on with peace. I want to add um, to what Peter just said. Uh, presence is probably the most powerful aspect of being with somebody, being present. Um, I had, when I, when I was in, I was in the hospital for 19 months. 13 of those months, I was in a cast, a body cast. I had a very serious osteomyelitis, bone infection in my right shoulder. They thought it was going to kill me. I had a surgery to um, try to remove the uh, infection, a scraping of the, the bone and irrigation. It didn't work. It wasn't successful. The second time I had the operation on the same thing, an, a young intern It was a VA hospital. He was a resident. He was being trained by a very skilled and respected orthopedic surgeon. But he was going to do the surgery. He came to me before the surgery, told me what he was going to do, and reassured me. And then after the surgery, he came to me while I was still in the recovery room, and he sat down on the bed next to me. He put his face this far from mine. He was looking at me with an openness that I had never received from a, a male. A, a, a father figure, a brother, another man. I had never had any man up to that point be that close to me with love in his eyes. And he, he said to me, I got it all. Now, in today's medicine, no doctor would ever say that because they don't know clinically that they got every single aspect of this infection. But he said that to me in a, in a state of mind and voice and presence. I believed him. Now, I didn't believe him intellectually. I believed him energetically. I was hooked into him. He was hooked into me. <laughs> it's it's uh, it's 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 immense in my heart. So I, you know, my my emotion is it's the only thing I. Well, I I would say that since my childhood, I have been slowly learning to release emotion that I must have stuffed for a long time. But when I see these and hear these stories, it, it's, I, I wouldn't even say it's joyful or it's sorrowful. It's just too hard to put a word on that expression of radiance because it is a form of radiance. I, 
feel so strongly that our culture, as Peter has said and Jean said before, has many, many ways of suggesting to us the limitations of who we are, the, the physical body, and the condition that we have. You know, we have a very, very uh, strong emphasis on genetics. I remember in the 50s, there were, there were lots of things said about cancer. And they were well-intentioned. It's not like it was ignorance or anything that was perpetrated. But they, they were putting out these messages about how fragile and how vulnerable and how much we had to pay attention and get your, if, if you're a woman, have your breasts examined. You know, does cancer run in your family? And that kind of suggestion is hypnotic. And we absorb this so seamlessly. So it's up to us to claim our own individual authority. I regret we are running short about closing time. And I want to acknowledge that we will be available just outside the door for more conversations. I'm remembering how powerful it is to be wheeled time and again into the operating room, looking at the lights go by, saying, well, this is it, I'm checking out. And I, well, that was seven, no, nine months ago again for me in the VA. But God keeps sending us back, saying we've got homework to do. Practice loving one another, knowing you are God's presence to be and do his will in all things. With that, thank you one and all. Namaste.